Welcome to Unapologetically Sensitive, a place to find connection and a sense of belonging, where you can learn, relate, laugh, and maybe even live a bolder, brighter life. I'm your host, Patricia Young. This is a weekly podcast where we talk about sensitivity and the richness that it adds, the strengths we have because of our sensitivity, and some of the challenges it poses as well. The information in this podcast is not a substitute for help from a licensed mental health professional. Hey there. To the creatives, healers, sensitives, and deep thinkers, welcome. I think you're going to enjoy this episode. It's with Joanne Jarrett, who's got the podcast Fancy Free, and I'll tell you a little bit about that, but it's a great conversation, and I think what you're going to enjoy specifically about this is... Joanne recently discovered she's an HSP, so she has some questions that she asks me, and they're questions that I haven't really talked about before, and she got some great insights while we were talking, and I think this is the benefit of having other HSPs that aren't as familiar with the traits, because I talk about things I don't normally talk about. During this episode, she asks me about something that she calls procrastination laziness, and we talk about what our society views as productive and efficient. And so it gave her some great insight. And I think I verbalized something that I haven't really talked about before. She talks about hitting a wall. And because she has a very high pain threshold, does that mean that that impacts how she shows up as a highly sensitive person? She also shares her superpower. And it's not something I've ever verbalized or heard verbalized, but it resonates with me. So I'm curious to know what you think. She had some questions about physical touch and the HSP, the need for having more space, where boundaries comes into play. She asks about what is inner stimulation because she didn't think she was having any of it. So when we talked about it, she had a really big aha moment. Also, during the episode, there's a word that she's trying to find. And so if you're like I am, I wrote down the word, didn't get back to her when we got off the recording. I asked if that was the word and she said yes. So I'm going to try and remember to come back on at the end. If you're a stickler and love words, I'll tell you what that word that she was trying to find is. Let me tell you a little bit about Joanne. Joanne Jarrett is a family physician turned stay-at-home mom with two teenage daughters. She blogs at Cozy City Clothes Blog and podcasts at Fancy Free Podcast. She loves to tell embarrassing, funny stories on herself to make others feel less alone in their imperfection. She has her own women's loungewear line, Shelfie Shop that sells super cozy street legal pajamas with comfy shelf bras for some support and coverage. She's married to a whip-smart, mischievous husband, Scott, who always keeps her laughing and doing the occasional chair-side dental assisting. She and her whole extended family recently moved from Reno, Nevada to rural Montana. And in this episode, she shares a couple of her most embarrassing stories, so hopefully you'll find that enjoyable. If you're enjoying the podcast, you can help me out by rating and reviewing. If you go to the show notes at unapologeticallysensitive.com and click on this episode, there's instructions in there. And now, on to the show. Hey, Joanne, welcome. Hey, Patricia, thank you so much. I'm I'm excited to talk to you today. I say that with every guest, but I genuinely mean it. so sweet. (laughs) Thank you. I'm excited to talk to you, too. And I'm a little nervous, which is weird. I don't know why. I've had that when I've been on some podcasts, especially talking about the trait. So I totally hear it. And it's like, we we do this all the time. And you and I were talking before we recorded that I listen to your podcast, the Fancy Free podcast, when I go to the gym. So I feel like I know you, you're in my ears, but I've never met you face to face. And then you have that same experience. And it's like we have these intimate relationships with people we've never met before, but this is kind of a mutual like you're my friend. You're my gym buddy. Yeah, totally. I've, it's like a mutual admiration society. I feel like I know you too. You're in my ear. You keep me company. You give me therapy. <laughs> You're teaching me so many new things. And I feel it's kind of a new sensation for me to feel so fond of someone I've never met. And it isn't like a fangirl thing. It's like, no, I feel like I really know know who you are in certain ways, you know? <laughs> I hear you because I have that same thing. I think you'd be such a fun girlfriend to have. Like, I just want to laugh with you because I love you're just so comfortable with your guests on your show. Thank you. Do you identify as a highly sensitive person? I do now. (laughs) (laughs) You have introduced me to this concept and I feel like it's really solved a lot of mysteries for me. I used to just say I'm this or I'm that, but it's complicated. Like I always knew that there was a piece I was missing 
to explain some of the nuances of my personality and my nature. And so, yes, I did Dr. Elaine Aaron's online assessment and I scored a 21. Mm. Definitely a highly sensitive person. So how recently did you find out you were a highly sensitive person? I think it's been within the year. Yeah, it's just basically okay. since I discovered you and and you asked me the question over email. I don't even remember exactly how we met, maybe in a Facebook group for podcasters. You asked me that and I was like, oh, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I just, I don't know how I missed it all these years. So yeah, it's this year. It's I'm 47 years old and I lived 46 years not knowing I was a highly sensitive person. <laughs> just thinking there was something wrong with me, like I'm a wimp or something. Yeah. Well, I found out in my 50s and I'm 56. <gasps> really? So. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Huh. yeah. I've only known a couple of years. What do you think of the term highly sensitive person? I know that it probably bothers a lot of people. I, and my husband wishes I wasn't this way, but I absolutely refuse to be angry about almost everything because I, I just, I think of anger as overstimulating. Maybe that's why. And I, I, I see that as kind of a mental laziness. Like I'm just not going to get up in arms about too much, but I think probably the reason why I really like it, I like that term. I'm a family physician. I'm in my 16th year of maternity leave, but I am a family physician. So when I hear sensitivity, I think neurological sensitivity. And I definitely feel like I identify strongly with neurological hypersensitivity. I don't get my feelings hurt very easily though. But when I do get my feelings hurt, I have a hard time getting over it. But Mm -hmm. yeah, so I like, I like the term. All right. What do you think about it? I don't think it's really descriptive. And I think our society thinks of sensitivity as being weak and fragile Mm -hmm. and somebody who cries a lot, where I think that we're incredibly perceptive and observant and responsive. Our brains are wired differently. We're wired differently, which is sounds like what resonates with you that you see it as being something neurological. Totally. And I, I just don't think that sensitive. How often do you hear people say, don't cry? Oh, to- yeah. I think the word sensitive is, yeah, there's some definite things within that word that I don't, I don't relate to at all. So yeah, I definitely, I think it's a, you know, it just kind of depends on your perspective, but I agree yeah. with you. I would be really interested to have, I would be interested to see if it were going to be redefined, what the words would be. Well, the research-based term is sensory processing sensitivity, but that also, if you're a lay person, that doesn't really say what it is either. So, you know, and, and I know that when Dr. Aaron came up with the trait, it made sense to her. So this isn't a dig on Dr. Oh, sure. Aaron, it's just something I'm curious it's about. It's just a process. You know, we, we progress as we, as we move forward and we're all learning as we go. So, yeah. Okay. I want to jump into some fun stuff. So why don't you tell us about your podcast and why you started it? And then can you tell us a story or two? Yes. Okay. (laughs) So there is one story that is sort of built into the reason why I do the podcast that it goes back, it goes back a little ways. I designed a line of women's loungewear and it's going to be coming to market very soon. I took a course on how to market clothing. And one of the things that my mentor said is if you are going to have something to sell, you have to have somebody to tell. So I begrudgingly started a blog, which very quickly gained a life of its own. I absolutely love it. I don't do it because, I mean, I still don't have anything to sell. And I love, I love my blog. I love writing. So I, when we moved to Montana, I gained a little bit of weight and I wasn't feeling like I had a lot of fun things to wear. So I went to Dillard's one time when there was a sale and I got stuck in a dress in the, in the dressing room. And I had to ask the clerk to come in and help wrestle me out of this dress. And it was so humiliating. I was like, mm. excuse me, can you come in here real quick? I need help. I need your help. <laughs> and there's, <laughs> I could see feet, like there's a girl in the next one over. Right. And I could just imagine her looking at herself in the mirror, like, oh my gosh. And then her ears perk up like, oh, this is going to be good. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I asked the gal to come in. She was so sweet. She, um, she, had a hurt shoulder. So she started like gathering up the dress and it wasn't that I couldn't find the zipper. It was just a way too small on me. I had crammed it on thinking, I really like this. I want it to work well. So she's gathering up the fabric and she's pulling it over my head. And I'm like, Oh, thank God I'm finally free. And then she stopped. And I was like, Oh, what what's wrong? And she's like, well, I have a hurt shoulder. This is as far as I can raise my hands above my head. So then I'm, you just picture me. I, I have my hands above my head, like a, an obedient toddler. And I'm now I'm in a deep knee bend in 
<laughs> in the <laughs> dressing room in front of this gal. So anyway, she finally helped me get out of the dress. And I almost asked her, am I your first? <laughs> because I thought, <laughs> sure, surely this is not something that has ever happened to this woman. But then I was too embarrassed to ask her. So I just got out of there. And, but by the time I picked my daughter up from gymnastics and her friend, we were howling with laughter, zooming down the interstate. And I thought to my, so, so anyway, I came home and I wrote a blog post about it. Cause I thought this is funny. And I also want to know how many other people this has ever happened to. I've never heard another story about it. So I posted the blog post and then I posted about it on Facebook and people came out of the woodworks. Like now I'm wondering if this, if anybody, this hasn't happened to like, and I said to myself, why aren't we telling each other these stories? Because, and I think, you know, for me, it kind of goes back to when I was in mops, mothers of preschoolers, I walked in there as a new mom and I felt just as vulnerable and ill-prepared as every other mom at my table. But because I have a medical degree, I, I, I sort of noticed these women like maybe kind of being impressed or whatever. And I was like, uh, uh, oh, heck no, do not be impressed by me. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a mess. And so I think I started really trying to show my underbelly and really trying to tell embarrassing stories to those women to kind of make them realize like, no, I'm just like you. And it was, and it brought so much connection and so much laughter. So I kind of baked that into my interaction style, but I never really did it formally until I told this story about getting stuck in the dress at Dillard's and I thought we've got to start telling these people, telling each other these stories, lowering the bar for each other, creating connectedness, normalizing imperfection and helping each other realize that we're not the only fools in town, you know? So that's why I started my podcast and it's called Fancy Free because I say at the end of every episode, no one is as fancy as they look. And I know that what I had a tendency to do when I was more immature in life is to compare my messy insides with other people's well put together outsides. And now that social media is so pervasive, that tendency, I think, is so amplified because people can really edit what other people see and trying to think of the word that you use when you're putting together a like an art display or something. Well, it's almost like a... <laughs> co it's like, um, anyway, I, I can't think of it right now, but it's when somebody really very carefully puts together a collection of things that they want to put out there for someone that is, I think what we do on social media. And this is really, I think, hurting how other people see themselves. And I think, I don't think we do it intentionally. Like if my life looked like a photo shoot on a given day, I, yes, I'm going to put pictures of that on the internet. I'm going to be proud to share that. But what but I think we need to give each other the gift of balancing it out with some embarrassing stories. So that is that has been kind of the impetus of my podcast. And another th another piece to it is that I went to a Christmas party several years ago where my girlfriend Karen invited a bunch of friends from all different walks of life. And we didn't know each other very well. We were doing this gift exchange. And what she had us do is when our number came up, she had us stand up and tell our most embarrassing story. I left that party having never laughed so hard at a party, feeling like I had 40 new close girlfriends. And with all of these nuggets in my head that I could reach for and loud about whenever I needed a pick me up. And I thought that was such a gift. And then when the, when the idea of the fancy free podcast cropped up, I thought, yes, I think I can, I think I can help people give each other this gift. So it has been so much fun. I, <laughs> I've had so many crazy stories from people. And I just, yesterday I just interviewed Abby Jimenez, who was a cupcake, cupcake wars champion. She had a couple of fabulous, fabulous stories. I can't wait to put those out. We laughed so hard. I had to excuse myself to blow my mm. nose <laughs> and I couldn't believe she, I mean, she had told these stories on the internet before, but she'd never told them in an auditory manner, which is my preferred way of digesting content because I can do it while I'm driving or, you know, whatever. So that is a really long answer to a really short question. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> 
No, I love it. And it's funny that I, when I go to the gym with my son, when he gets off work, I save your podcast and I listen to your podcast when I work out and I laugh so much. He just, that's awesome. I love it. And I think in the way that you're wanting to break that myth of people looking fancy is what my mission is too, that the things that we think are shortcomings is being highly sensitive. I want to break the shame on it. And kind of that myth that you were saying that for therapists and people that look like we've got our stuff together, we're still human. We still have struggles. It doesn't mean that we're not living fulfilling lives. Really wanting to kind of pull the curtain back on that so that when people have struggles day to day, they know like it's not a bad thing. It's not dangerous. It's just part of being alive. Yes. Yes, absolutely. I feel like, I mean, we, we all have the human condition, right? No matter how well no, no matter how successful we are, no matter how polished we we come off, no matter how accomplished our education is or our publications, et cetera, we all suffer the human condition. So why don't we laugh about it and connect with each other on it? And and I think the other the the piece that you are really putting forward in such a beautiful way is I think understanding you're you're helping us understand a different aspect of our nature so that we can relate to the world and each other in a more, you know, in a more educated way. And it's, it's just all about creating more authentic connection and through, through understanding and revelation, really, we we have to reveal these things about each other if we want to connect on them and learn more, learn more about them. Absolutely. And I, even though the way that we're doing it, you and I are doing it is different. It's really about that sense of shame that if other people saw this or knew about me, I would be rejected. And the truth is when we find safe people to share what feels messy and uh, like would be rejected over is where the connection is provided that there are people that have the capacity to respond to us. People have to earn the right to tell our stories. That's a Brene Brown thing. But Mm. that's really where the connection is when we go into that place of like, I don't know, I feel uncomfortable. This stuff is going on and it doesn't feel like it's pretty and polished and perfect that's where we get this deep sense of connection. So that's why I think the work that you're doing is so important and valuable. Oh, thank you. And I, I definitely, and I know people understand this once they listen to the podcast, but I, I I have to figure out a way to express to people who are just getting my elevator pitch that I am not laughing at people. I am laughing at myself and we are laughing at ourselves together. And it is not about, I, 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 t- I tell my guests, I don't want you to tell a story you're not ready to laugh about because I don't want to cause pain, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. because they, these stories aren't, you can't always tell them, share them right away. You can't always see the humor in them right away. But, you know, once you live with them for a little while, a lot of times you can, and then it's like, okay, now you're ready to turn it into a gift for someone else. If you're not to that point yet though, then those stories kind of have to wait. And I think I kind of came to understand that that aspect of it. I wrote an article about getting a piece of toilet paper stuck to the back of my pants. And the weirdest thing is, okay, I was at a swim meet, which I mean, talk about being a highly sensitive person. A swim meet is the worst environment for an HSP. Oh mm-hmm. my goodness. But you know, I, I love my daughter and, and I want to support her. So I'm there and the parents are all, we all have to volunteer. So you're in this echoey, loud, chlorine humid, hot environment where you're asked to volunteer as a timer. And I'm thinking, I don't, I can't do that. I don't know what to do. Well, yes, you do. They just teach you how to do it. And then you can do it. So I'm at the swim meet. I'm, I'm working a double shift. They have chairs at the end of the lanes. And then when the swimmer comes to their last, the end of their last lap, you stand up, you lean over the edge of the pool and you watch and you click the timer right as their hand touches the wall. So I'm doing this. I'm sitting between two dads two swim dads that I don't know. And so I'm kind of trying to entertain them with funny stories and the bottom line is that about two and a half hours into my three hour timing session, I realized I was told by one of my daughter's friends, you have toilet paper on the back of your pants. Oh, no. So I, I, I reach <laughs> back and I, I pull up like a three foot long piece of toilet paper and I have black pants on. And for the last two and a half hours, I've been leaning over the edge of the pool about every one minute. Mm. So the, but the, and it was, I was like, okay, number one, thank you. This little girl for, you know, having after the fact, my daughter said, yeah, mom, we were back there. I heard people back there talking. I didn't know they were talking about you, but I heard him say, no, you tell her, no, you tell her. Mm. (laughs) And then, uh, but the weirdest thing is, and this is, this was kind of a turning point in my mind was 
I wasn't embarrassed. Mm. And I was born embarrassed. I was embarrassed to be alive all through my adolescence. You know what I mean? And so, and I'm very easily embarrassed. And so I, I thought now this is fascinating. I am not embarrassed. I just balled up the piece of toilet paper, threw it in the garbage can and went back to my station. And then a bunch of us swim moms and kids went out to lunch afterward. And I was sitting with three other moms at a table and we're roaring with laughter about this toilet paper tail I had. Okay. I was telling my girlfriends, look, look, either I've given up. I mean, the fact that I'm not embarrassed means either I've completely given up or I've grown up. And I think the truth is somewhere in between Mm -hmm. because I have given up. I've given up on trying to put forward a perfect facade. Can't happen. Totally impossible. Wouldn't be good anyway, because nobody wants, nobody wants to be friends with somebody who's perfect and can't, you know, you can't relate to. Right. And secondly, I think, you know, just growing up is being able to move more quickly from being embarrassed to being um, amused. (laughs) So um, that's another, another, I haven't actually, I don't know if I've really told that story on my podcast before. I think it's, uh, I've told like a really short version of it. That was another kind of pivotal moment for me when I thought, okay, I think I've progressed here. I want to help other people progress through through this, whatever it is. Right. And I think that there's so much power in that. I've been procrastinating filling out the form on your website to be a guest only because you asked some specific questions that have nothing to do with an embarrassing story that I'm just kind of hung up on. But I had been thinking about what stories do we want to tell and really nothing stood out in my mind. I think because of kind of what you're saying, like, stuff happens and I just kind of roll with it and move on and forget about it. I I have stories from when I was young that feel mortifying because I was probably young and it felt mortifying, but I really, I had to think for quite a long time of like, what's a story that would be embarrassing to tell somebody? And I think that's the gift of when we do the work that I'm doing with my podcast or people are doing the work with your podcast of talking about embarrassing stories is we normalize it and we don't make it these terrible secrets that if anybody knew we would be yeah. mortified. It's like, yes. yep, here's another place where I showed up in a messy way. Mm-hmm. And you know, the, the word shame, I think is such an interesting word. And I think I, I always say I'm really good at guilt, but I'm not very good at shame because I, and I don't want to be good at shame, obviously, you know, but I think there is so much shame out there. And I feel like the difference for me between guilt and shame is I did something bad and I am something bad. And so, you know, I'm, if I'm guilty about something, it's because I did something I shouldn't have done. That guilt is normal, natural guilt that will assuage in, you know, depending on how we deal with the situation after the fact. But shame is something that is psychologically damaging and I feel un- unnecessary because I am as, as many things as I, you know, as many things as I do, I, I am not bad, you know? Right. And so I think when you take an embarrassing situation and you let it define who you think you are, you let it chip away at your self-concept, that's really damaging. And I think being able to laugh about it and being able to see that other people do it makes shame less likely. I totally agree with you. And it's really interesting that what my experience is in working with some of the people that I, I work with, that when as highly sensitive people were told that we're too, stop crying, stop making a big deal. We learn that how we show up and how we're wired is not okay. And I think that starts yes. to develop that shame core Yes, as opposed to an adult saying, I don't really understand that you're wired differently and I'm not quite as sensitive or as in-depth as you are and I'm not really able to adequately meet your needs and teach you what you need to do. So instead, I'm going to give you some messages that make you feel like there's something wrong with you. I mean, yes, that's, that's a, a ridiculous way of looking at it, but that's really what happens on a level that we don't talk about. Absolutely. And completely unintentionally. Nobody's trying to hurt sensitive. I mean, every now and then there's, there's a jerk who's trying to hurt us, but for the most part, we're all just trying to be good to each other, but because our natures are so different, we can't relate. And so I think one of my other passions as an introvert, and we'll have to talk more about that (laughs) because now I'm questioning that, but is to help extroverts and, and people who aren't highly sensitive understand what it's like to be an introvert and what, what introverts or highly sensitive people. And I'm not saying introvert equals highly sensitive. I'm saying, you know, those are two 
aspects that, you know, the Venn diagram overlaps quite a bit. But people who aren't highly sensitive, people who aren't introverted have a really hard time re- relating and understanding. And so some damaging things do come out of their mouths. Like if you were a completely exuberant, non-highly sensitive, extroverted parent, and you had a highly sensitive and introverted child, you might say to your child, you never hang out with your friends. Why don't you go make more friends? And what I think is so important to understand is that an introvert, and I'm not sure about highly sensitive because I haven't learned this particular piece from you or others yet, but an introvert for sure is much more likely to have separate and deep friendships. So if that parent understood that, they wouldn't be criticizing their child for their style, their, you know, their friendship style. It's just a different style. It's not negative and it doesn't mean your friends not, or that your child's not succeeding socially. Mm -hmm. I always love to put in education. So I'm going to jump in here. So if we're looking at whether it's introversion or extroversion, we want to go back to the four core characteristics. So depth of processing, over arousal, over stimulation, emotional responsiveness, empathy, and then sensitive to subtlety. So when you talk about an introvert going deep, that's one of the characteristics of being a highly sensitive person. So somebody could be an introvert, but enjoy chit chat, enjoy relationships that don't go deep. You'd want all four core characteristics to go there, you know, if you're looking at a highly sensitive introvert, but so much of what has been written about introversion overlaps the traits of highly sensitive people. So people assume if you're an introvert, you like one-on-one, you like going deep, you've got that closeness, that intimacy. That's not really the case if you're not a highly sensitive introvert. So that's your PSA for today. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I love it. And I I mean, I, I can't believe that at this age, I'm learning such new things because I am a personality type junkie. And I thought I was really well, <laughs> real well informed. But I am definitely a highly sensitive person. I know this to be a fact. My nerves get jangled easily. I'm very quick to be to feel overwhelmed. I absorb the feelings of my environment to the point where I walked in the other day, my husband was in the garage and he was I was like, Oh, hi. And he's like, Hey, and you know, he didn't mean to be dismissive. I'll be darned if the the next thought in my head wasn't, oh, are we mad at me? Mm-hmm. I literally thought that inside my head. Are we mad at me? And I'm like, oh my God, Joanne, you are a separate person. Are you kidding me? What with that with that thought? But that's where I went. Yep. Um my husband loves to have meaningful conversations, but he he loves to do it with the TV on. I hate the TV. I'm like, I cannot focus on this conversation with that crap in the background. You know, mm-hmm. so And I'm definitely sensitive to subtleties. So now I have a lot more work to do in learning whether or not I'm truly an introvert or if I'm, or if all of the things that made me think I was an introvert just make me a highly sensitive person. Mm -hmm. And I don't, you know, again, I don't think the labels are so important, but I, I've said this before that when I thought I was an introvert, I thought that I needed to have more time alone and I disconnected. It was really an excuse to not do social things because it has to be the right type of social things. And if I don't get enough stimulation and connection, I get kind of depressed and lethargic, which is why Mm -hmm. I have such strong feelings about people understanding, because if you're a highly sensitive extrovert, we need some connection. For me, I've got a limited time frame. The venue has to be right. The people have to be right. What we talk about has to be right. I need to get that. And then I'm done and I need to go home and recharge. So it's not like I get totally build up being alone, but I get a reset. But part of what is kind of exciting and fulfilling to me is having connection with people, but I I can't do it all the time. So interesting. Yeah. And this is why I think that I love, love, love doing podcast interviews and (laughs) interviewing people for podcasts because it's so measured. You get to connect deeply, but you're not really interacting face to face. And so it doesn't feel like it depletes me quite as quickly. And it does, it energizes me, which, and and I just, I just love that. So, you know what you are, I just, I'm learning so much from you. I think this is so, (laughs) it's so fascinating to, I mean, you know, we're all kind of egocentric by nature. So I'm always, I'm thinking, well, okay, I figured out that I have, I'm this label. And therefore every single other person who has this label must have all of these characteristics. And so it would really surprise me when somebody else that I thought was very similar to me, didn't want to go deep with me. You know, yeah. it's like, wait, what? You don't, huh? You don't want to do that? Well, okay. I'm confused, you know? Yeah. And it's interesting. I run these online courses for HSPs and this is the third round that I'm running now. And I'm starting to see an evolution in them changing. 
that what I'm seeing in this round is people find a sense of similarities in their traits. And many of the people show up very differently that even though we have the trait of being a highly sensitive person, how it shows up for us is very different and how people show up in group is very different where the second round of group, there was much more similarity. And so I kind of assume that this is what the groups had and I'm seeing in this round. Interesting. It's it's just a different flavor and yeah, it's just fascinating to me. So there's so much more variation than you maybe would have expected yeah. for people who are signing up for this particular experience. Mm-hmm. Huh. Yeah, and I've got wow. four groups running right now. So I feel like that's a pretty reasonable sample of how people show up in a group as HSPs because how they show up individually is very, very different to see what gets activated when we're in a group and does this get activated in other groups and are there ways that we can do healing in the group so that whatever we're thinking is happening that may not in the group. I mean, the wound of too much comes up a lot, feeling like someone's talking too much, they're taking up too Mm. much time, needing to get reality checks where there's so much healing that I see happening because the group is a really safe, contained experience. And so can you do healing in the group and then take that outside of the group in safe areas? Because we kind of think that what happened to us in the past is often happening in the present and it's not, but we don't get a chance to test it out. So we're kind of doing Groundhog Day. Mm, mm -hmm. Oh, how interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's just fascinating. Awesome. You had some questions that you wanted to ask about being an HSP. Is this a Oh, it's my podcast. I guess I don't need to ask for consent from you, do I? <laughs> no, you don't. And I wear my my heart on my sleeve, so you can ask away or t- t- instruct away. <laughs> okay, so you want me to ask my questions about being an HSP? I was listening to episode forty four recently, and I, you, you guys, you and your guests briefly touched upon the topic of the concept of internal overstimulation, and I just want to hear more about that because my perception is that all of my overstimulation is environmental and not internal. So I want to, I just kind of wanted to examine that a little more. Sure. I'll do my best. I don't think I've really ever talked about this too much. If you're interested, I'll put uh, in the show notes for episode 44 with Jacqueline Strickland. It's where we take a pretty deep dive into introversion and extroversion and the highly sensitive person. My understanding about having a deep internal life is that because our, I, I think I'm getting this right, because we have such an active insula that our ability to kind of reflect on what happens, to process what happens, we often have that inner voice that's observing or criticizing what's going on. And I can't tell you how many people I've talked to that we have a social interaction and then we go home, we like, did I talk too much? Did I share too oh much? My gosh, yes. That part that goes into regret. And it's kind of funny that in the groups, what I often, there are two things that I see is people have vulnerability hangovers that either they share and then they feel like they shared too much and they kind of have shame over it. So we talk about that. Mm. And then the second thing is that we often will say things and then we go into judgment about what we shared, how much we shared. And we talk about that oftentimes when we have that sense of connection and it feels good, that that inner voice goes like, you must have taken too much. The other person Mm. didn't get their needs met. And I don't, my assumption is that this probably comes from a place of wounding that many of us, including me, have the wound of too much and not enough. I take up too much. I need too much. And then I also feel like I don't have anything to offer. But this is a theme that I see coming up consistently. And so we go out into the world and then we have reflections about it. I often know when things happen that are really upsetting to me, that in the past I would have said I'm ruminating, but I just know now that like I need to chew it apart. I need to look at it from all angles because I really Mm. want to understand what happened. How am I responding to it? Is there something that I need to do? And I just allow that for myself. So to me, that's what that internal processing looks like. Okay. I understand. So I definitely do this to myself. I just didn't realize it. And I have a few girlfriends that do this too. And so we have sort of short shorthand language for it. I'll be like, okay, so you know, the other day when we were hanging out, we we're doing this and that. Well, I went home and I rewound the tape, which means I did exactly what you're talking about, where I played the conversation over in my head. I looked at it from every angle. I wondered how she felt. I reflected about how I felt. I worried that maybe I offended or didn't explain myself properly. And I did this a lot in terms of my medical career too. And I think that's one of the reasons it was so exhausting for me. Um, Okay. So because I always found, I always thought of retreating into my own head as my replenishing place. 
it didn't occur to me that I could overstimulate myself internally. But I think that's the piece that's internally overstimulating is when we are, we analyze something and we have to just kind of give ourselves space to do that because I think it's very valuable as long as we're, as long as we're not, you know, driving ourselves to a place of shame over it. I do too. And I can tell you that when I've had things happen in my life that I'm not happy about, that I don't feel like I have a lot of control over, I have to be mindful about how much time I spend on something. And when I go like, okay, it's time to shift gears because that tendency that the feeling state is so strong that I want to make up a story about the feeling state. And then I like to pull in every injustice that's ever happened to justify. Mm -hmm. And that's not always really helpful. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely not productive when you have a, you know, a million things to get done. You just, you need to allow yourself to hang out there for a minute and then go, okay, it's time to move move forward. Well, and I think that part of the healing process is allowing for those feelings and then figuring out sometimes we need to take time and really be with them and honor them. Sometimes we need to give them a limited amount of time. And sometimes we need to acknowledge them and make a choice that we're going to do something else for the time being. I always use the example, like, I don't always want to brush my teeth and take a shower. I do it because it's good for me and it makes me feel good. And I, if I spent all day thinking about, am I going to brush my teeth? Am I going to take a shower? Like it wouldn't get done. And sometimes we just have to do it and move on yeah, without beating up on ourselves about it. Yes. I have definitely learned the, the skill of making appointments with myself to worry. And so I get really overwhelmed when there are time, time limits to things like when there's a deadline and I find that I'm a procrastinator. I think part of it is because I really like to examine a task internally and, and, and sort of sit with it and think about it and let it kind of play in the background of my mind oh, for a long time before I focus my energy on it. And that helps me be ready to focus my energy on it. But it was when it comes to something like, okay, I want to make sure I have the five meaningful Christmas gifts that I love, love to give our girls each year for Christmas. I noticed that as Christmas comes closer and closer, I get so anxious about it. Well, in the last couple of years, I have said to myself, you are not allowed to worry about this until December 1st. You can think about it and you can kind of try to process it. And if you have ideas, write them down. And if you think of something to buy, go ahead and buy that. But you are not allowed to be stressed out about this until December 1st. Because I start ramping up and it's like, no, you're not going to spend two months worrying about what you get your kids for Christmas, you know? So I feel like I've, I've kind of, without really realizing it, have limited myself on some of that kind of stuff. And it, it helps. It's like, I can manipulate myself, I guess. Well, and I would, I mean, I'm, I'm very meticulous about words. So instead of manipulate, I would say choose, I get to choose where I'm going to mm -hmm. put my time and attention. And it sounds like, yeah, it's not like I'm tricking yeah. myself into it. I'm just <laughs> saying, you know what, Joanne, no, this is not productive for you. This is harmful for you and you're not going to do it. Yeah. So I'm making a choice. Yeah. I realized that I have a choice and then I made the choice. Right. I want to go back to something too, that it's not uncommon after we have a socialist situation. Like I used to think that I was gossiping. And once I realized I'm a deep processor, that I often want to talk with somebody about what happened and what I perceived and what I saw because there was a nuance and somebody said something. And and so I've just really come to accept it. Like the reality is I have a lot of judgments. I accept that. <laughs> <laughs> but I also really want to chew apart interactions because it's fascinating to me and I pick up on something. And so I've really yes. taken that judgment off. Like I'm not gossiping. I'm just really wanting to process. Yes. Oh my gosh. That is such a light bulb moment for me because I do the same thing. And my, and it just, that's why, you know, I say I have those certain girlfriends for which we have this, this shorthand. I've rewound the tape and now I want to talk about the tape. Whereas my husband has no tolerance for mm -hmm. that. And he, it, and I used to just think it's because he's a better person than I am. And he doesn't want to like chew the fat and gossip and and, you know, it's not like I want to say bad things about people. I'm talking about myself as much as I am about anyone else. It's just I want to I want to investigate, evaluate and, you know, analyze an interaction on a deeper level. So thank you. Thank you for giving me the permission to do that and not feel guilty or like I'm some kind of deviant person or gossipy because I my one of my very strong values is is to not gossip, even though I feel like my nature. I love I love a juicy tidbit. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just love it. Like my husband could, he could not care less. He's like, I don't need to know that kind of stuff. And I'm like, I find it fascinating. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Oh my gosh. That's so interesting. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much. for Yeah. That. Yeah. 
Did you have another question? Yes. I'm not sure if this is, is a question, but I just want to kind of put this out there and see what you think about it. So I usually, I sort of shorthand term myself a lazy perfectionist, which I always have felt like is a really hard place to be wedged. <laughs> now that I'm learning about the fact that I'm a highly sensitive person, I'm looking at it more as the tension between being an overachieving doer and being a highly sensitive person. So I think I'm probably over overstimulating myself with my expectations. What do you, are you an overachieving doer? Not so much. And I, I used to joke like I was a perfectionist without anything to show for it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> but I think that there are a couple of, of things here and you and I had talked before we recorded and I had, uh, I just dug myself into a hole. I'm familiar with what goes on with medical school and that there's a part of you that just has to learn how to push through and you cannot mm -hmm. honor your sensitivities when you're staying awake and not getting sleep for days at a time. Yeah. Okay. I think that there are a couple of things that sometimes for us, we think that we're procrastinating but we're really processing in the back of our minds. Like if we have something that's due a project or something that we need to do, and we feel like we're procrastinating. Sometimes I think we're, we're kind of like, we're growing like for my podcast, I thought I was putting it off for 17 months. And I really, the podcast baby was just germinating and it needed that much time mm. to figure out what I needed. But we often feel like we're not doing anything because we process on such a deep level. Now, some of us need to wait until the last minute because it kind of gives us a kick of adrenaline because now we have that pressure to hurry up and produce something. So for some people, they kind of like that high of the last minute rush to get stuff done. And so I'm not sure. Tell me a little bit more about what it looks like for you, because I think I went in a little bit of a different direction. Well, it's OK. I think that I have very high expectations for myself and I am very action oriented and I have been an overachiever. I feel like I'm a, I feel like I'm a, um, I'm a recovered overachiever, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like I was such an overachiever for so long. I don't know where these high, they're deaf. They were definitely high internal expectations. My parents were not pushing me to go to medical school. They just wanted me to do something that would be fulfilling. Um, but, and I felt like I had to always be doing, 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 I felt like that's where my value mm -hmm. lie, lay. And I think once I learned that that is not where my value is sourced, I kind of got over it. And so I feel like I was just browbeating my highly sensitive self. It's not that I had this part of me that wasn't highly sensitive. It was that I was just stuffing the, high, the, the sensitivity into a corner and not honoring it or not, not taking care of it because I had such high expectations of myself. And there were so many things in medical training that were completely exhausting, but I've heard highly sensitive people talk about hitting a wall. I definitely relate to that in the last few years of my life. But like, for, like you said, when, when I was in training, sometimes we would work 36 hours on 12 off for a whole month there's, you're not allowed to hit a wall. You just have to keep going. And so, and I was very successful at that. So that to me, that kind of flies in the face of being a highly sensitive person. But also one of the things I don't relate to about being highly sensitive is I don't think I have a low pain threshold. I was actually a competitive gymnast growing up and I've always just kind of worn my injuries as a badge of honor and been able to really push through the pain. I did CrossFit for a long time as an adult. I did medical school, which is very painful. And so I don't know, I was kind of a wimp when I gave birth to my kids, though. I thought I was going to just be all demure and quiet and push them out. And I like screamed and yelled and climbed the walls just like everybody else does. But I don't know. So I feel like I just went in a million different directions there. But I think rather than being an overachieving doer, pointing to evidence that maybe I'm not as highly sensitive as I thought I was. I think maybe more just was I was immature, didn't know myself well, and was just not honoring that part of myself. What do you think? about? Well, that? there's a, a lot to unpack there. So let me start with the last thing. <laughs> I think some of us okay. do have a high pain threshold. My appendix ruptured, I think on a Wednesday night. <gasps> what? On Friday, I went to the hospital, they admitted me for exploratory and didn't even do they, they did they, they admitted me for <sighs> observation and then did exploratory surgery. So we can have a high 
pain yeah. threshold. Yeah. So you have a high pain <laughs> threshold. That's really scary. You know what? I'm glad you're alive. Oh, I'm, I'm glad you're alive, but I'm surprised you're alive. <laughs> yeah. Wow. But I think that our society really values external markers of success, doing mm-hmm. achievement. And that's where we get a lot of our validation and value. And what I hear from the HSPs that I work with and, and what I've talked about is, Many of our strengths tend to be the soft skills. We're really good at connecting and listening and attuning. And those aren't as measurable. Our skills often come with being. And you've demonstrated as a highly sensitive person, you went to medical school, you have the capacity to push yourself. We all do. So just because we're highly sensitive doesn't mean that we can't be successful. We can't push. We can't achieve. What I think happens is as we start to learn about ourselves and we tune in, we have to make that choice. Is this something that I'm going to push through? Are there going to be ramifications if I do that? And where do I want to make my choices? But when we don't know, Mm -hmm. we just do what's Mm -hmm. in front of us because we don't know this is how we're wired and we don't know that we're needing something else. I, okay. I had that. It reminds me of an epiphany I had a few years ago. So several years ago when we lived in Reno, I had a gastroenteritis bug that was a weird one. I didn't have any vomiting or diarrhea. I simply was nauseous if I moved and it was significant nausea. It was awful. And I had a rash. It was some kind of viral thing. And I, because I'm a mover and a shaker and a doer, and my husband worked long, long hours and had two kids at home. I did all of the household management, took kids everywhere they needed to go, all, all kinds of stuff, helped my family out. But for those three or four days, I couldn't do anything. And my poor husband had to, you know, he was still working, but he had to either schedule for help because I even talking on the phone was so hard for me. Or he had to, you know, make arrangements to do everything himself. So he was cooking dinners. He was taking kids places. He was still working full time. He was talking to my mom and my friends and arranging everything. And I felt like I was going to disappear because I thought, and that is when I realized that I was placing all of my value on the things that I do for my loved ones. And yet at the end of those four days, my family still loved me. My husband still wanted to be my husband. My children still admired, loved me and wanted to spend time with me. And it was like, oh my God, I don't have to do all of these things to be a valuable person. I just am a valuable person. And I think what you're saying about being perceptive and noticing nuance and subtlety and being able to listen, understand, you know, sort of analyze things with people. That is much more where my, where my actual skill set lies. I can be a doer and an overachiever, but I kind of run myself ragged doing that. Mm -hmm. And so I delegate a lot more than I used to, and I don't feel bad for it. And I think that's a less, I wish I'd learned that lesson 20 years ago. Yeah. And I think for those of us that are primary caretakers in our families and relationships, regardless of gender or stereotype, that we're the ones that if we've got kids, we know everything they're allergic to and what medications they've been on and what their schedules are. And we just hold so many details. And oftentimes our partners don't. I'm again, I'm just making a generalization, but we're the emotional glue that holds everything together. We're the detail keepers, we're the, you know, all of that stuff. And that mental load can really feel like a lot. So just like you're saying, when you got sick, my guess is your husband's like, oh, holy moly, she's really juggling a lot of stuff that there's a lot yeah. here that I have to now deal with. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's the other, th- that's the other piece is that it was, he- and because my love language is words of affirmation, he gave me so much love after that. He was like, oh my gosh, you're such a good mom. Mm. I mean, he had always had told me those things, but I think he just realized them on a deeper level after he had to manage the household and do everything. He just realized how much I was doing that I was kind of behind the scenes holding things together. And yeah, so yes, he definitely learned and he gave me what I needed from that realization because words of affirmation are so important to me. That's a, That's another thing. I would love to hear about as far as I think you have an episode on it. I think it's one I haven't gotten to yet. So maybe tell me if I should just be referred to your episode, but do you do HSPs tend to have the same love language or a group of love languages? That's a really good question. I honestly don't know. I know there's an episode with Tom Murray. It's early on maybe episode, I don't know, three, four, and -hmm. it's called the five love languages. I honestly don't know my, I don't know. I kind of want to say that even though we share the trait of being sensitive, I think that it 
probably varies, but I honestly don't know. I, I think I'm going to do some polls on that. I would love to know. I'm just, I love data. I'm so fascinated by learning all this stuff. So, ooh, goody. Okay. I do too. I want a researcher because I have all these questions I want to ask, but I'm not a researcher. And like, I really want to do mm-hmm. in-depth. I, I want somebody to answer my questions. I don't want to do the research. <laughs> huh. You want to know the answers so badly, but the actual digging around of the data is not your thing. I'm a really good idea person. I'm a great visionary. Mm. And putting things into place is really not what my strength is. And I think that's where a lot of my overwhelm comes from, where in an ideal world, I would have a team behind me. So I could... Yeah, I think you need a virtual assistant who's doing some of this stuff for you. Yeah, where I can generate these ideas and I've got a team behind me that can put into action the things that I want to know about and to make my ideas come to fruition. Totally. The dog's not doing it. I'm a little disappointed. I may have to fire her. Dang it. I know <laughs> my dog's not good either. She's, she looks like na- a nanny dog, but she doesn't take care of the children worth the dog. I know. <laughs> I know. Uh, well, you know, th- gosh, thank you just for fleshing through a couple of those issues with me. I I'm sorry. My questions are so all over the place. So I have one more question to ask you in terms of being an HSP. If we have more time. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. I am very curious about what you're finding with your average HSP, and I know we're all over the map, so it's a little bit um, false to even say average, but in terms of physical intimacy, I find that face-to-face interaction, especially close face-to-face interaction is very overstimulating for me and overwhelming. And I need a break from it, which makes me sad because my husband's love language is touch. And um, it's like, you can touch me, but don't move. <laughs> like, it's just, it, it makes it feel like he's poking me. If he's like, if he's holding my hand and he's rubbing his thumb back and forth, I'm like, ah, please stop that. And he's like, Oh my gosh, I'm just trying to show you some love, you know? And it's just, it's a disconnect for us and we're doing great. We've been married 22 years. We're very much in love and we have a very successful, intimate relationship. But I do find that I feel like I have to sort of ignore the HSP part of me when I'm giving him what he needs, which is hard. Yeah, that's a great question. I, I'm making notes because I'm going to start doing some polls because, again, I would suspect that there's variance in it. But I can imagine somebody like caressing my hand could feel overstimulating. And I've got this blind dog that needs to be touched constantly. She's almost Mm -hmm. always on my lap. And I love touching her because it's very soothing to me. But if someone was doing that to me all the time, and I know that like there's a certain way I like to be, I call it a tickle touch, a tickle tease on my back. Uh Uh-huh. And as many yeah. times as I've tried to explain what that's like to somebody, like they just don't get it. And if they do it huh. wrong, it irritates the heck out of me. But if you know how I oh like it, gosh. then I really like it. So for that perspective. Yeah, no, I'm just, I'm so relating to you right now because I love nothing more than to sit with a cap, cat on my lap. This overachieving doer, the brakes slam. If a cat gets on my lap and I'm just petting the cat and the cat is purring, there's nothing more soothing to me, but if you try to pet me, I will bristle and I become a porcupine. I hate it about myself, but I, okay. So yeah, I just, I feel like, like if I'm holding Scott's hand, I may be moving. I don't even know, but it doesn't irritate me when I do it. But when he does it to me, I just can't even. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And there's a thing like, I think my husband used to like put his nails on my fingernails and it would just drive me crazy but I can do it to him and it doesn't bother him at all. Interesting. So I I think it just really depends. And like physical space, if, if I feel comfortable and I want to invite you into my physical space, you can get pretty close to me, but people that I don't know or don't want in my physical space, like there's a bubble. And if you cross that, I'm like, (laughs) you feel violated. You need to back up. Yes. So yeah, I am. I definitely feel like for me, it's prolonged physical intimacy that drives me crazy. It's like, I I just need to withdraw for a minute. And then I'm in for it again. Like I love hugging my husband. I love hugging him, but that hug lasts more than about five, six seconds. I'm like, I got to go. It's it's just strangest thing. I don't know. And I I almost wondered if it was a control thing and and not even related to being a highly sensitive person. I don't know. Cause that's control is a whole nother follow acts, you know? Yeah. Well, and it's hard if we have attachment styles and boundary issues. I know years ago before I did boundary work, it felt like people were just going to absorb me. 
And so it, mm-hmm. I didn't really want to get close to people because it felt like they were just going to absorb me and suck me dry. And once they started to learn about where you end and where I start, was able to put boundaries into yes. place that wasn't as much of a deal. So I, I think oftentimes there's wounding, there's trauma, there's attachment okay. wounds, there's boundaries, and trying to tease okay. those things out. I mean, bottom line, if we know what it is that we want or don't want, and we're having a hard time getting it, we can work with somebody to figure out how to get what we need. And it doesn't matter what we yep. call it or where it came from. So that's the good news. Totally. Yeah, for sure. I think the boundary thing is really interesting too. When my kids, I have two kids, they're 22 months apart. And so when they were really young, they were all over me. And I felt like they started doing things to my physical body, like wiping their hands on my clothes. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh my gosh, I need to teach their chil- these children that they don't own my body. Like I am their mother, but I'm a completely separate entity mm-hmm. <laughs> and they need to respect that physically. And once I figured that out and I taught them just a few things that didn't hurt their feelings, it made being their mother so much easier. And I think that might be a boundary thing too. Yeah. And I think we're all different. I, I tend to be that like, let's all flop together. Let's cuddle. Let's like, I just really like that closeness and connection but I'm a stimulation seeker in some ways. So my guess is it shows up differently for different people. And whatever it is that you're needing is valid because you're needing it. And it doesn't, you know, whether it's about wounding or boundaries or trauma, if that's what you're feeling and needing, then it's really important to figure out ways to get that because we need to feel safe and contained regardless of what the reason why is. Yeah. But if it's it's the result of a poor boundary or a wounding, then you can sometimes, you know, you need it for now, but you want to work on not needing it and and, and working through that and solving, solving that so that, yeah, I don't know. Well, and ultimately that it's like when we can say no, we can say yes. And so when Mm -hmm. it feels like if, if we're not able to talk about what it is that we need, then we create distance because we don't know how to take care of ourselves. And the gift of learning to create boundaries and to do our work is then it really gives us skills so that we can move in close in relationships and have that intimacy and connection that we want. And when we've had enough, we set a boundary, we take a step back. But when we don't have that, the only thing to do is to create distance. And mm-hmm. and then we create isolation for ourselves and that doesn't work either. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Joanne, we're needing to wrap up. Is there anything that you want to talk about before we go that you haven't had a chance to talk about? And then I'm going to ask you to you know, tell people where they can find you and if you have any offerings. I thought your question about what is your superpower as an HSP is really interesting. And I'll just tell you really quick. I feel like my superpower is diffusing discomfort. Mm, mm -hmm. (laughs) And that is an intangible, you know, but it, but it is, um, it is what I love to do. I love to assess. Well, I love to, I used to love to wait tables and I would try to turn the grumpy gusses into cheerful, you know, warm, happy people by the end of the meal. And I just found it such a challenge. So anyway, that is my superpower as an HSP. I would never want to give it up. I love being able to make people feel more comfortable in in whatever setting they find themselves in. I love that. And my guess is that we're able to spot the people that are uncomfortable more so than the non-HSPs. Yes, I can definitely do it on a completely different level than my husband. He finds it fascinating. You know, he's like, what are you finding out around here? And I'm like, oh, let me tell you. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So you wanted to know where you can find me. There are a few different places. I blog at cozyclothesblog.com. My podcast is the Fancy Free Podcast. The website for that is fancyfreepodcast.com. I have an online store that is not quite up and running, but it'll be Shelfie Shop, S-H-O-P-P-E. And my Instagram handle is I've Got Dishes. So I would absolutely love for anybody to connect. I just think that the work that you're doing is so amazingly important. I think it's better done through community and I love connecting. So I'd love to see you in those places. Sounds great. Thank you so much for being here today. It's been a fun conversation. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thanks. All right. Have a great day. Thank you. You too. Bye. Bye. Hey there. So I'm curious to know what you thought of the episode. What did you think about her superpower of diffusing discomfort? I think we're really good at it. And this is a term I've really never thought about before or just consciously thought of. So I thought it was really pretty spot on. The word she was looking for is curated. That's a hundred points for you if you figured out that the word was curated. I think 
you'll really enjoy her podcast. It's something I really enjoy. I have a hard time finding podcasts that are just kind of light and funny that can help me switch gears. So check out the Fancy Free Podcast. If you're interested, I run online groups for HSPs a couple times a year. If you go to my website at unapologeticallysensitive.com and go to the HSP groups page, I continually am updating the website and when we're going to be running groups and kind of just trying to get it a little bit more streamlined. So if you're interested, you can go there. If you're struggling with things like boundaries or perfectionism or feeling like how you're showing up isn't okay, or you're doing really well, and there are just some things that you kind of need some fine tuning with, those are great reasons to reach out for one-on-one coaching. And if I have space, I would love to work with you. I provide a free 20-minute consult. I work online. So anywhere that you're in the world, we can connect if you have a strong enough internet connection. I hope you found this helpful. Remember, sensitivity is nothing to apologize for. It's our superpower. Have a blessed day. 